The Twentieth Voyage It all started less than a day after my return from the Hyades, a spherical cluster so thick with stars that the civilizations there hardly have room to turn around. I hadn't even unpacked half the suitcases, filled with specimens, and already my arms were falling off. I decided to put the luggage in the cellar and attend to it later, when I'd rested up a bit. The return trip had taken forever, and all I wanted now was to sit back in my carved armchair by the fireplace, stretch out my legs, put my hands in the pockets of my old smoking jacket, and tell myself that besides the milk boiling over on the stove, there was nothing I had to worry about. Yes, four years of such traveling, and you can get pretty tired of the universe, at least for a while. I'll walk over to the window, I thought, and see not the black void, not sizzling prominences, but a street, flower beds, bushes a little dog lifting its leg beneath a tree with complete indifference towards the problems of the Milky Way, and what a joy that will be. But, as is usually the case with such dreams, it didn't work out that way. I noticed that the first parcel I pulled off the rocket had one side bashed in, and fearful for the hundreds of priceless specimens I'd collected, immediately set about unpacking. The bingets were all right, but the mups had gotten crushed on the bottom. I just couldn't leave things like that, and in a few hours had knocked the lids off the largest crates, opened up the trunks, spread the fenicles over the radiator to dry... They were soaked through by the tea from the thermos, but I really shuddered when I saw the stuffings. These were to have been the pride and glory of my collection. All the way home I had tried to think of just the right place for them, as they are the greatest of rarities, those products of the militarization on Regulus, a civilization conscripted in its entirety. You won't find a single civilian there. Taxidermy is no hobby among the Regulans, as Tottenham writes, but something between a religious practice and a sport. Tottenham simply fails to grasp the grounds on which they stuff, Taxidermy on Regulus represents a symbolic act. Thus Tottenham's remarks, full of wonder, and his rhetorical questions, too. They only demonstrate his total ignorance. Marital taxidermy is one thing, school taxidermy quite another, and then there's the vacationing kind, the dating, etc. But I can't go into that now. Suffice it to say that in carrying the Regulusion trophies upstairs, I slipped a disc, so although there was still a bundle of work to be done, I said to myself that this hit-on assault would accomplish little. I hung the chimpers up on the clothesline in the basement and went to the kitchen to fix supper. And now only loafing, siestas, dolce far niente, I said firmly. Of course, an ocean of memories continued to assail me like a swollen tide when the storm has passed. While cracking an egg, I looked at the blue flame of the burner. Nothing special about it, yet how very like the Nova of Perseus. And those curtains there, as white as the sheet of asbestos I'd used to cover the atomic pile that time when... No, enough, I told myself. Decide instead how you want your eggs, scrambled or fried. I had just settled on sunny side up when the whole house shook. The eggs, still raw, flopped to the floor, and as I turned to the stairs I heard a long, drawn-out rumble, like an avalanche. I threw down the skillet and ran upstairs. Had the roof caved in? A meteor? But that was impossible. Such things didn't happen. The only room I hadn't cluttered up with packages was the study, and that was where the noise was coming from. The first thing I saw was a pile of books at the foot of a tilting bookcase, out from under the thick volumes of my cosmic encyclopedia crawled a man, backwards, crushing the fallen books with his knees, as if the damage he had done them already wasn't enough. Before I could speak, he pulled out some sort of long metal rod after him, holding it by its handlebars. It resembled a bicycle without wheels. I coughed, but the intruder, still on all fours, paid absolutely no attention to me. I coughed louder. However, now his profile seemed oddly familiar. But it was only when he stood up that I recognized him. He was myself. Exactly, just like looking into a mirror. I had indeed already experienced, once, a whole series of such encounters. Still, that had been in a swarm of gravitational vortices, not in the peace and quiet of my own home. He glanced at me in a distracted way and bent over his instrument. The fact that he had taken charge of the situation so, and particularly that he didn't see fit to say something, finally put me out of patience. What is the meaning of this? I try not to raise my voice. I'll explain in a minute. Hold on, he mutters then gets up, drags that tube thing over to the lamp, slants the shade to get better light, adjusting the paper while holding the arm in place. He knows, the dog, that the shade will fall, so he has to be me, and touches some knobs with his finger, clearly troubled. You might at least apologize. I can no longer hide my growing irritation. He smiles. He puts aside his contraption, that is, rests it against the wall. He sits in my armchair, opens the middle drawer, takes out my favorite pipe, and unerringly reaches for the tobacco pouch. This is really too much. What nerve, I say. With a sweep of the hand, he gestures for me to have a seat. I can't help but take stock of the destruction done, the bindings of two heavy astronomical atlases broken. However, I pull up a chair and twiddle my thumbs, waiting. I'll give him five minutes for explanations and apologies, and if I'm not satisfied, well, there are other ways to settle things. Come now, remarks my uninvited guest. You're an intelligent man. 
Just how are you going to settle things? Any bruise I get today will only be yours later on. I say nothing, but I'm thinking. If it's true that he is me and that somehow, but how, for God's sake, I've gotten myself into a time loop again, and why am I the one these things have to happen to, then he may indeed have a right to my pipe and even my house. But what reason was there to go and knock over the bookcase? That was unintentional, he says, through a cloud of aromatic smoke, examining the tip of his shoe. Quite stylish, too. He crosses his legs, swings the top one back and forth. The chronocycle threw me while braking. Instead of 8.30, I flew in at 8.30 and one hundredth of a second. If they'd set the sight better, I would have arrived in the center of the room. I don't understand. And I don't, not any of it. First of all, are you a telepathist? How can you answer questions which I'm only thinking? And secondly, if you really are myself and have come through time, what does that have to do with place? Why did you destroy my books? If you'd stop a moment and think, you'd figure that all out for yourself. I'm later than you, so I must remember what I thought. That is, what you thought, since I am you, only from the future. And as for time and place, the earth, after all, is turning. I skidded one hundredth of a second, perhaps even less, and in that brief interval, it had time to move, along with the house, those thirteen feet. I told Rosenbeiser it would be better to land in the garden, but he talked me into this sighting. All right, supposing that's true. But what does it all mean? Well, obviously, I'm going to tell you. However, let's have supper first. It's a long story, and of the utmost importance. I've come to you as an emissary on a historic mission. I found myself believing him. We went downstairs, made supper, such as it was. All I did was open a can of sardines, and there were a couple of eggs left in the icebox. Afterwards, we remained in the kitchen, for I didn't want to spoil my mood by having to look at the bookcase. He wasn't overly eager to wash the dishes, but I appealed to his conscience, and he finally agreed to wipe. Then we sat at the table. He looked me gravely in the eye and said... I come from the year 2661 to make you an offer, an offer which no man has ever heard before, nor will again. The research committee of the Temporal Institute wants me, that is, you, to be general director of its theo hip hip effort, which abbreviation stands for Teleotelechronistic Historical Engineering to Optimize the Hyperputerized Implementation of Paleological Programming and Interplanetary Planning. I'm confident that you will accept this high position, for it carries with it extraordinary responsibility towards the human race and history. And I know that I, that is, you, are a man of both initiative and integrity. I'd like to hear something a little more specific first. What I really don't understand is why they didn't simply send me a delegate of that institute instead of you. I mean, myself. How did you, that is, how did I, get there in the first place? That I'll explain at the end and separately. As for the main business, you remember, of course, Moltres, that poor man who invented a manual time-traveling device and wishing to demonstrate it perished miserably for he aged to death immediately upon takeoff. I nodded. There will be more such attempts. Every new technology entails casualties in its initial stages. Moltres had invented a one-seat time buggy without any shields. He was doing exactly what the medieval peasant did, who climbed the church steeple with his wings and killed himself on the spot. In the 23rd century, there were, or rather from your standpoint, will be, clock cars, calendar sedans, and cinco scooters. But the real chronomotive revolution will only begin 300 years later. Thanks to men I will not name, you'll meet them personally. Time travel over short distances is one thing. Expeditions deep into the millennia, quite another. The difference is more or less like that between going for a stroll downtown and journeying to the stars. I come from the age of chronotraction, chronomotion, and telechronics. There have been mountains of nonsense written about traveling in time, just as previously there were about astronautics. You know, how some scientist with the backing of a wealthy businessman goes off in a corner and slaps together a rocket, which the two of them, and in the company of their lady friends yet, then take to the far end of the galaxy. Chronomotion, no less than astronautics, is a colossal enterprise requiring tremendous investments, expenditures, planning. But you will find this out for yourself when you get there, that is, at the proper time. Enough now of the technical aspect. The important thing is the purpose behind it. We haven't gone to all this trouble just so someone can frighten pharaohs or kill his own great-great-grandfather. The social structure of Earth has been regulated, the climate also, in the 27th century, from which I come. Things are so good, they couldn't possibly be better but our history remains a constant source of aggravation to us. You know the state it's in. High time, then, we put it into shape. Now, wait a minute, I said, my ears humming. You're not happy with history? Well, but what difference does that make? I mean, it's not something you can change, is it? Don't be ridiculous. It's precisely Theo Hip Hip that heads our list of priorities. I already told you, teleotelechronistic historical engineering to optimize the hyperputerized implementation of paleological programming and interplanetary planning. For world history to be regulated, cleaned up, straightened out, adjusted, and perfected, all in accordance with the principles of humanitarianism, rationalism, and general aesthetics. You can understand, surely, 
that with such a shambles and slaughterhouse in one's family tree, it's awkward to go calling on important cosmic civilizations. The regulation of the past, I said, dumbfounded. Yes. If need be, alterations will be made even before the rise of man, so that he arises better. The necessary funds have already been gathered. However, the post of general director of the project is still vacant. Everyone's frightened off by the risks connected with that job. There aren't any volunteers? My astonishment was growing by the minute. Those days are gone, where every jackass wants to rule the world. Without the proper qualifications, no one's anxious to take on a difficult assignment. Consequently, the position remains unfilled, yet the matter is pressing. But I don't know a thing about it. And why me, of all people? You'll have whole staffs of specialists at your disposal. Anyway, the technical side of it will not be your concern. There are many different plans of action, different proposals, policies, methods. What's needed are carefully thought out, responsible decisions. And I, that is you, are to make them. Our hypercomputer examined by Psychoprobe every man who ever lived and concluded that I, you, are the only hope of the project. After a long pause, I said, This is, I can see, a serious business. Perhaps I will accept the position, and then again, perhaps I won't. World history. Hmm. That'll take a little thought. But how did it happen that I was the one, that is, that you were the one, to approach me? I certainly didn't go anywhere in time. It was only yesterday that I got back from the Hyades. Obviously, he interrupted. After all, you're the earlier me. When you accept the offer, I'll give you the chronocycle, and you'll go where, that is, when, you're supposed to. That's not an answer to my question. I want to know how you ended up in the 27th century. I got there on a time vehicle, how else? And then from there, I came to you here and now. Yes, but if I didn't take any time vehicle anywhere, then you too, who are me... Don't be stupid, I'm later than you, so you can't possibly know now what's going to happen to you after you take off for the 27th century. You're evading the issue, I muttered. Look, if I accept this offer, I go straight to the 27th century, right? There I direct this theo hip hip thing and so on. But where do you come into the pic... We can go on this way all night, round and round. Look, here's what. Ask Rosenbeiser. Let him explain it to you. He's the authority on time anyway, not me. Besides, this problem, hard though it may be to grasp, and time loops are always like that, is nothing in comparison with my mission. With your mission, that is. It's a historic mission we're talking about, after all. So what do you say? Is it agreed? The chronocycle will work. It wasn't damaged. I checked. Chronocycle or no? I can't just up and go like this. You have to. It's your duty. You must. Ho, ho, none of that must talk with me, if you please. You know how I dislike it. I will if I want to, when I'm convinced the situation demands it of me. Who is this Rosenbeiser? Research director at ITS. He'll be your top assistant. ITS? The Institute of Temporal Studies. And what if I refuse? You can't refuse. You won't do that. It would mean... Well, it would mean that you hadn't the courage. A smile seemed to flicker on his lips as he said these words. This made me suspicious. Really? And why is that? Because... Eh, I can't explain it to you. It has to do with the structure of time itself. Nonsense. If I don't agree, then I don't go anywhere, and thus this Rosenbeiser of yours will explain nothing to me, nor will I be regulating any history. I said this partly to gain time, since one doesn't make such important decisions at the drop of a hat, but also because, though I was completely in the dark as to why he, that is I, was the one who came to me, I had the funny feeling that there was some catch, some deception involved here. I'll give you my answer in forty-eight hours, I said. He began to urge me to decide at once, but the more he insisted, the more suspicious I became. Eventually, I even started having doubts about his identicality with me. He could have been, after all, an agent in disguise. As soon as that occurred to me, I resolved to test him. The trick was to think of some secret that was unknown to any but myself. Why does the numbering of the voyages in my star diaries contain gaps? I shot the question at him. Ha ha, he laughed. So now you don't believe in me. The reason is, old boy, that some of the journeys took place in space and some in time. Therefore, there can never be a first. You could always go back to when there were none and set out somewhere. Then the one that had been first would become the second, and so on ad infinitum. That was right. However, a few persons did have knowledge of this. Though true, they were my trusted friends from Professor Tarantoga's Tichological Club. I asked them to see some identification. His papers were all in order, though that still proved nothing. Papers can easily be falsified. He weakened my skepticism considerably by being able to sing everything that I was wont to sing while, and only while, traveling great distances, all alone. I noticed, however, that in the refrain of shooting star, shooting star, he was terribly off-key. I told him this. He took offense and said that I was the one who always sang off-key, not he. Our conversation, till now reasonably peaceful, turned into an argument, then a violent quarrel, 
Finally, he got me so furious that I ordered him out of the house. This was said in anger. I didn't actually mean it. Yet he rose without another word, marched upstairs, put his chronocycle into position, sat on it like a bike, moved something or other, and in a twinkling of an eye had vanished in a cloud of smoke, or more precisely, a puff, as if from a cigarette. That, too, was gone in a minute. All that remained was the pile of books strewn every which way. I stood there, feeling foolish. For this I hadn't expected, and by the time he'd started preparing to leave, I couldn't very well have backed down. Mulling it over a moment or two, I turned around and went back to the kitchen, since we had been talking for three hours at least, and I felt hungry again. There were still a couple of eggs in the icebox, a strip of bacon, too, but when I turned on the gas and began frying them up, a terrible crash resounded on the second floor. I was so startled I ruined the eggs. They flopped out, bacon fat and all, right into the flame, while I, cursing everything under and above the sun, rushed upstairs three steps at a time. Not a single book was left on the shelves. The remainder lay in a huge heap, from under which he clambered out, dragging the chronocycle after him with difficulty, for he had fallen on top of it. And what is this supposed to mean? I shouted, livid. I'll explain in a minute. Wait, he mumbled, pulling the chronocycle over to the lamp. He inspected it, preoccupied, not even bothering to offer an excuse for this second intrusion. This was really too much. You could at least apologize, I yelled, beside myself. He smiled. He set aside the chronocycle, that is, propped it against the wall, found the pipe, filled it with my tobacco, lit it, crossing his legs, until I saw red. Of all the nerve, I screamed. So far I hadn't budged, but swore he'd be black and blue before I was through with him, playing practical jokes on me and in my own home. Oh, come now, he said and yawned. It was plain he didn't feel at fault. And yet he had just dumped the rest of my books all over the floor. That was unintentional, he observed, puffing away. The chronocycle skidded again. But why did you return? I had to. Had to? We are, my dear boy, in a circle of time, he calmly said. Presently I'll be urging you to accept the position of general director. If you refuse, I'll take my leave, be back before long, and the whole thing will start from the beginning. That's impossible. We're in a closed curve in time? Precisely. I don't believe you. If that were true, everything we say and do would have to be an exact word-for-word -word and blow-by-blow -blow repetition. And what I'm saying now and what you're saying is no longer completely the same as the first time. There are all sorts of old wives' tales told about traveling in time, he said, and the one you've mentioned is among the most ridiculous. In a time circle, everything must follow a similar course, but not at all the same, since closure in time, much as closure in space, does not by any means rule out freedom of action. It only limits it severely. If you accept the offer and depart for the year 2661, the circle will thereby be transformed into an open loop. But should you refuse and kick me out again, I'll only return and... Well, you know what the result will be. So I have no alternative, I said, boiling. Yes, from the very first, something told me there was double dealing at the bottom of this. Out of my house! Out of my sight! Don't be an ass, he replied coldly. What happens depends entirely on you now, not on me. Or to put it more accurately, Rosenbeiser's people have shut the loop, locked it on the both of us, and we'll stay stuck in here until you agree to be director. Some offer this, I shouted. And what if I just whopped the living daylights out of you? You'd only have the same dished out to you when the time came. It's your choice. Turn down the offer, and we can amuse ourselves like this for the rest of our natural lives. Is that so? I'll lock you in the cellar and go where I damn well please. Like as not, I'll be doing the locking since I'm stronger. Oh, you should only know. The food they serve in the year 2661 is a great deal more nourishing than here, than now. You wouldn't last a minute with me. We'll see about that, I growled, rising from the chair. He didn't budge. I know Fujoto, he casually remarked. What's that? A form of perfected judo from the year 2661. I put you out of action in a second. I was infuriated, but my many experiences in life had taught me to control even the most violent passions. And so, having talked to him, that is, to myself... I reached the conclusion that there really was no way out of it. Besides, this historic mission waiting in the future, it accorded with my views as well as with my personality. The coercion was the only thing that I resented. However, I realized it was not with him, a pawn, that I ought to deal, but with those whom he represented. He showed me how to operate the chronocycle, gave me a few pointers, so I climbed into the saddle and was going to tell him to clean up after himself and also call the carpenter to fix the bookshelves, but didn't have time, for he pushed the starter. Then he, the light of the lamp, the entire room, everything, disappeared, as if blown out. Beneath me, the machine, that metal rod with its widened, funnel-like exhaust in the back, shook, at times jumping so violently I had to grip the handlebars with all my strength to keep from falling off. I couldn't see a thing, but only had the sensation as though someone were rubbing my face and body with a wire brush. When it seemed that my headlong rush into time was growing excessive, I pulled the brake, 
whereupon shadowy shapes emerged from out of the swirling blackness. These were enormous buildings of some sort, now bulging, now slender, and I flew right through them like the wind through a picket fence. Each such passage seemed to threaten collision with a wall. I instinctively shut my eyes and turned up the speed again, that is, the tempo. A couple of times the machine kicked so much that my head jerked and teeth rattled. At one point I experienced a change, difficult to describe. It was like being in some thick, syrupy medium, in glue that was hardening. The thought occurred to me that I was now passing through a barrier which might eventually become my grave, and that I and the chronocycle would be trapped, both frozen in concrete like some strange insect in amber. But again there was a lurch forward, the chronocycle quivered, and I landed on something elastic which yielded and swayed. The machine slipped out from under me, a burst of white light hit me in the eyes, I had to close them, blinded. When I opened them again, a hum of voices surrounded me. I was lying in the middle of a large disk of foam plastic that was painted with concentric circles like a target. The overturned chronocycle was resting nearby, and all around stood men, several dozen of them, in glittering jumpsuits. A short, balding towhead stepped onto the mattress of the disk, helped me up, and shook my hand repeatedly while saying, Glad to have you aboard, Rosenbeiser. Tiki, I automatically replied. I looked around. We were standing in a hall as big as a city, windowless, with a sky-blue ceiling hung high overhead. Spread out in a row, one after the other, were discs, exactly like the one on which I had landed, some empty, some bustling with activity. I don't deny that I had a few biting remarks prepared for the benefit of Rosenbeiser and the other creators of that temporal net they'd used to haul me from my home, but I said nothing, for suddenly I realized just what this vast hall reminded me of. It was like being in a gigantic Hollywood studio. Three men in armor filed by... The first had a peacock plume on his helmet, a gilded buckler. Laboratory assistants adjusted the jewel-encrusted medallion on his chest. A doctor administered an injection in the knight's uncovered forearm. Someone else quickly fastened the cuirass straps. He was given a two-handed sword and a wide cloak emblazoned with griffins. The other two, clad in simple steel, squires probably, were already seated on the saddles of their chronocycle, at the center of the target, while a voice from a loudspeaker boomed, Attention, please. Twenty. Nineteen. Eighteen. What's this? I asked, bewildered, for at the same time, about thirty feet away, there was a procession of emaciated dervishes in enormous white turbans. They were getting injections, too, and a technician was arguing with one of them. It seems the traveler had been caught with a small pistol concealed beneath his burnous. I saw Indians in war paint, wielding freshly sharpened tomahawks, laboratory assistants frantically straightening their feathered headdresses, and on a small wooden cart, an attendant in a white apron was pushing towards another disc a dreadfully filthy, tattered beggar without legs, who bore a striking resemblance to those monstrous cripples out of Bruegel. Zero, announced the loudspeaker. The three in armor on their chronocycle vanished in a faint flash which left a whitish vapor hanging in the air, not unlike the smoke from burnt magnesium. I was already familiar with that effect. These are our poll takers Rosenbeiser explained. They study public opinion in various centuries. All statistical stuff you understand, strictly information gathering. So far, no corrective steps have been initiated. We've been waiting for you. He showed me the way with his hand and followed after. I heard voices counting down. There was a flash here, a flash there, wisps of pale smoke drifting up. More and more exploring parties disappeared. New ones took their place, all exactly as in some huge movie studio during the filming of one of those awful history spectaculars. I soon realized that it was forbidden to take any anachronistic objects along with one into the past. The pollsters, however, kept trying to smuggle them through, either out of perversity or else for their own convenience. Well, I thought we'd put a stop to that soon enough. There would be some changes made, but I asked only, And how long does such information gathering take? When will that night with the squires return? We keep on schedule, said Rosenbeiser with a satisfied smile. Those three got in yesterday. I said nothing, but thought to myself that it wouldn't be easy getting accustomed to life in a chronomotive society. The laboratory electrocar that was supposed to take us to the administration building broke down, so Rosenbeiser ordered a couple of pollsters off their camels. They were Bedouins, and in this improvised fashion we made it to our destination. My office was enormous and done up in the modern style, in other words, transparent, which is an understatement since most of the chairs were altogether invisible. And when I sat at my desk, only the piles of paper indicated where the top was. Yet because, in leaning over as I worked, I kept seeing my own legs in their striped trousers, and the sight of those stripes made it difficult to concentrate, I finally had all the furniture given a coat of paint to make it opaque to the eye. But then it turned out that the chairs and tables possessed the most idiotic shapes, inasmuch as they hadn't been designed for viewing, Eventually, they were all replaced with a set of antiques from the second half of the 23rd century. Only then did I feel at home. I may be getting ahead of myself by mentioning such trivialities, yet they do give some idea of the inefficiency of the whole project. 
Granted, my life as a director would have been paradise if all I had had to worry about was interior decorating. It would take an encyclopedia to relate everything the project did under my supervision. Therefore, I shall, as briefly as I can, sketch out only the major stages of our work. The organizational structure was symmetrical. I had under me TIC, the Time Interferometry and Calendrical Kinetics Division, with sections in quantum field and dispersion temporology. And then there was the historical division, containing the faculties of human and inhuman. The head of the technologists was Dr. Rob Boskowitz, while Professor Pat Lado was in charge of the history makers. Beyond that, I had at my personal disposal squads of history commandos and chronoshootists, horror troopers, time jumpers, with a brigade for emergency dethronement, as well as surveillance force. This standby corps, a sort of fire department for any unforeseen and dangerous turn of events, bore the acronym MOIRA, Mobile Inspection and Rescue Auxiliaries. At the time of my arrival, the technologists' temporalists were ready to begin full-scale telechronic operations, while in the province of human affairs, run by Harris S. Doddle, an assistant professor, the experts had worked out hundreds of EDENs, educational engrams. Similarly, the Department for Inhuman Studies, Obadiah Goody, Sphere's engineer, had drafted up alternate proposals for improving the solar system, that is, the planets with Earth at the head, also the course of biological evolution, anthropogenesis, etc., all these above-mentioned subordinates of mine I later had to get rid of, one by one. Each of them is connected in my memory with a different crisis within the project. I shall deal with these at the proper time to let the human race know to whom it owes its present predicament. In the beginning I was full of high hopes. Having taken a rush course in the elements of telechronics and chronoscopic permutation, and having mastered, too, the administrative intricacies, the delegation of authority, division of labor, and so on, during which, even then... I came into conflict with the head accountant, Eustace C. Liddy. I saw how monumental was the task that had been thrust upon me. The science of the 27th century provided me with many different technologies for operating in time, and as if that wasn't enough, there were hundreds of different plans to renovate history, all waiting for my signature. Behind each stood the weight and wisdom of world-famous experts, and I was supposed to pick and choose among this embarrassment of riches. For so far, there was no agreement, neither about which method we would use to improve upon the past nor from which point to begin, nor even how much intervention there ought to be. The first phase of our activity was marked with great optimism. We decided not to touch the history of man just yet, but instead put in order all the epochs, eras, and eons that preceded it. This grand design provided for, among other things, the devulcanization of the planets, the straightening of the Earth's axis, the creation on Mars and Venus of conditions favorable for their future colonization, while the moon was to serve as a kind of embarkation platform or way station for the emigration flights which would take place three to four billion years later. With vision of a better yesterday in my head, I gave the order to launch the generators for the establishment of isochronalities, Genesis. Three models went into action, Breekeek, Kex, and Coax. I no longer recall what exactly those abbreviations stood for. The first had something to do with kilowatts and kinematic effects, the second was either k meson excitation or kinogenetical exobiometry. The results surpassed our wildest apprehensions. There was one malfunction after another. Instead of breaking gradually and synchronizing itself with the normal flow of time, coax fired Mars with an explosion and turned it into one big desert. The oceans all boiled off and evaporated into space, and the scorched crust of the planet cracked open, creating a strange network of troughs, each hundreds of miles in diameter. Hence the 19th century hypothesis about the canals of Mars. Not wanting the people of the past to learn of our activity, for this could give them serious complexes, I ordered the canals to be all carefully patched, which Engineer Lavache, in fact, did around the year 1910. Subsequent astronomers were not surprised by the canal's disappearance, attributing the whole thing to an optical illusion on the part of their predecessors. Kex, which was supposed to render Venus fertile, had been safeguarded against the malfunction of coax thanks to Cupid, cyclochronic unidirectional polarization of inchoate differentials, However, the fail-safe integrators, falsies, failed miserably, and all of Venus was enveloped in a cloud of poisonous gas caused by the ensuing chronoclism. Engineer Vodenlecker, the man in charge of these operations, I summarily dismissed, but when the research committee interceded on his behalf, I let him carry out the last stage of the experiment. This time, it was no mere malfunction that followed, but a catastrophe of truly cosmic proportions. Set in motion against the current of duration, Breekeek, penetrated the present of 6.5 billion years before, emerging so close to the sun that it pulled from it an enormous chunk of stellar material, which, coiling up under gravitational forces, gave rise to all the planets. Vardenlecker defended himself, claiming it was thanks to him that the solar system ever came into being. 
for if that chronal nose cone hadn't proved effective, the chance of planets forming would have been practically nil. Astronomers were to wonder afterwards what star could have passed so close to the sun as to pull from it the protoplanetary matter, for indeed such close approaches of stars are among the most unlikely of events. I removed the impertinent fellow once and for all from his position of technochronical director, since, as I saw it, it wasn't the point or purpose of our project that such things be done by accident, through negligence and oversight. If it had come to it, we certainly could have done a better job of fashioning the planets. And anyway, the Tick Division had nothing to boast of, not after what they did to Mars and Venus. Next on the agenda was a plan for straightening out the Earth's rotational axis. The idea was that this would make its climate more uniform, without polar frost or equatorial heat. Our purpose here was humanitarian. More species were to survive in the struggle for existence. The result turned out to be precisely what we didn't want. The greatest ice age on Earth in the Cambrian period was produced by one engineer, Hans Jakob Plitzlich, when he fired off a heavy rectifying unit which gave the Earth's axis its so-called wobble. The first glacial epoch, instead of cautioning the hasty temporalist, indirectly brought about the second. For seeing what he had done, Plitzlich, without my knowledge, then proceeded to fire a correctional charge, which led to chronoclasm and a new ice age, this time in the Pleistocene. Before I was able to remove him from his post, that incorrigible man succeeded in causing a third chronal collision. It's because of him that the Earth's magnetic pull doesn't coincide with the axis of rotation, for the planet still hasn't stopped teetering. One of the time fragments of the readjuster flew to the year 1 million B.C. In that place we have today the great crater of Arizona. Fortunately, no one got hurt. There weren't any people around then. Only the desert burned. Another splinter came to rest as late as the year 1908. The natives there speak of it as the Tungus meteorite. Well, that was no meteorite, but only bits and pieces of the shoddily constructed optimizer careening through time. I kicked Plitzlich out without regard for anyone, and when he was caught sneaking into the crematorium at night, his conscience bothered him, if you please, he wanted to repair the damage he had done. I demanded, as his punishment, exile in time. I finally relented, which I now regret, and following the advice of Rosenbeiser, filled the vacancy with Engineer Dizzard. I had no idea that he was the professor's brother-in-law. The sequel to this nepotism in which I had been unwittingly involved wasn't long in coming. Dizzard was the inventor of RAIN, Radiant Energy Interchange, subsequently perfected by time specialist Boomeland. They reasoned thus. If even simple chronoclasm is accompanied by the release of tremendous temporal energy, then instead of having it take the form of destructive blasts, the sort that devastated Mars, let it at least be turned into pure radiation. This half-baked idea of theirs, intentions don't count, caused me a lot of grief. Rain did indeed convert the kinetic energy into radiation, but what good was that when the radiation, right in the middle of the Mesozoic, killed off all my dinosaurs, every last one, and God only knows how many other species in the bargain. Boumelant tried to defend himself by arguing that this was actually a good thing, since it cleared the evolutionary stage, thereby permitting the appearance of the mammals, from which man himself derived. As if that were a foregone conclusion. They deprive us of our anthropogenic maneuverability by committing sauricide, and then have the nerve to boast about it. Dizzard made a great show of remorse and even submitted a written apology, but it isn't true that he voluntarily stepped down from his post. The fact of the matter is, I told Rosenbeiser that as long as his brother-in-law remained on the project, I wouldn't set foot in the office. After this string of disasters, I called the entire staff together and made a little speech, warning them that I saw no alternative but to take tough measures from now on against those endangering the safety of the past. It would no longer be simply a matter of losing a comfortable position. Accidents were understandable, they told me, if not unavoidable, what with the launching of so unprecedented a technology. Just consider the number of rockets that fell apart when space travel was in its infancy. And our enterprise, taking place as it did in time, entailed dangers that were incomparably greater. The research committee recommended a new chronometrist. This was Professor Lenny D. Vinch. I gave him and Boskowitz fair warning with regard to the next experiment that nothing would or could again compel me to show leniency in the event of any serious mishap caused by carelessness. I showed them the memos Vardenlecker, Boumeland, and Dizzard had written to the research committee behind my back, appeals full of contradiction, for sometimes they would lay the blame on the objective difficulties and sometimes turn around and call the outcome of their errors commendable. I told those, too, that I wasn't the ignoramus some people took me for. A simple knowledge of the four arithmetic operations was all one needed to figure out how much material from the sun had already been wasted, irretrievably, too, since the outer planet's real garbage dumps, no cesspools full of ammonia, were completely useless. Mars and Venus, too, I scratched out, and gave the go-ahead for the final attempt to improve upon our solar system. The program envisioned converting the moon into an oasis for the weary astronauts of the future, as well as a transfer point for those on their way to Athena. You never heard of Athena? I'm not surprised. 
That planet was supposed to have been perfected by the team of Gestirner, Starbuck, and Astroyani. Such losers the project never had before. Dunder, diachronic uncertainty detector and entropy regulator, didn't work. Duff, durational force fields, broke down. And Athena, till then moving in orbit between Earth and Mars, shattered into 90,000 separate pieces, and what remained was the so-called asteroid belt. As for the moon, those optimizing geniuses of ours butchered its surface completely. It's a wonder the whole thing didn't blow up, too. Hence that famous riddle of 19th and 20th century astronomy, for the scientists couldn't understand where all those craters came from. They developed two theories to explain it, the volcanic and the meteor impact. What nonsense. The author of the so-called volcanic craters was time technician Gestirner, in charge of Duff, and the one responsible for the meteorite type, that was Astroyani, who had taken aim at Athena three billion years in the past and sent it off to kingdom come. The recoil of that chronoclysis, ricocheting in every direction, stopped what was left of Venus's rotational motion, gave Mars two spurious satellites that went the wrong way. So you see by then it was peanuts for this specialist to turn the surface of the moon into a missile range, letting fragments of Athena fall on it throughout the next billion years. But when I learned that one of the chips from the chronotractor, the explosion smeared it over two billion nine hundred fifty million years, had landed in prehistoric times, had moreover plunged into the sea and bored a hole in the ocean floor, sinking Atlantis in the process, I personally threw the perpetrators of this compound catastrophe out on their ear and took action against those responsible for the operation as a whole, in keeping with my previous decision. Appealing to the committee didn't help them one bit. Professor Lenny D. Vinch I sent packing to the 16th century, and Boscovitz to the 17th, so they couldn't get together and scheme. As you already know, Leonardo da Vinci spent the rest of his life trying to build himself a time coop, but he never succeeded. Leonardo's so-called helicopters and other machines, as bizarre as they were incomprehensible to his contemporaries, represented abortive attempts to escape exile in time. Boscovitz conducted himself more sensibly, I think. This was a man of uncommon abilities, with an exact mind. Indeed, he was a mathematician by training. In the 17th century, Boscovitz became a truly brilliant, albeit universally ignored, thinker. He tried to popularize the ideas of theoretical physics, but none of his contemporaries understood a word of his treatises. To lighten his exile, I sent him to Ragusa, Dubrovnik, for secretly I sympathized with him, yet still felt that it was necessary to punish those responsible with severity, no matter how much the research committee held it against me. And so the first phase of the project ended a complete fiasco. I absolutely refused to consider the initiation of any further tries in the Genesis series. Enough had been sunk into it already and lost. The barren wastes from Jupiter on out, Mars burnt to a crisp, Venus poisoned twice over, the moon in ruins, those so-called mass cons, mass concentrations beneath its surface, are actually the bits and pieces embedded deep in the ground and set in hardened lava of the nose cones of Dunder and Duff, and the lopsided axis of the Earth, the hole in the bottom of the ocean, the separation of the land masses of Eurasia and the two Americas, brought on by the rift it caused. That was the dismal balance, so far, of all that we had undertaken. Nevertheless, forbidding myself to be discouraged, I threw open the doors of active optimization to the crews of the historical division. It had, you will recall, two faculties, Human Affairs, Assistant Professor H. Doddle, and Inhuman, Spheres Engineer O. Goody. The entire division was headed by Professor P. Lado, who from the very beginning aroused my distrust with the radical, uncompromising nature of his views, which is why I preferred not to touch history proper just yet. Anyway, it made more sense to design the kind of intelligent beings that could do the job of civilizing history themselves. Therefore, I held back Lado and Doddle. It wasn't easy, either, the way their hands were itching to get at the past— and ordered Goody to start the evolution of life on Earth rolling. And, so they couldn't accuse me later of stifling creativity, I gave Project Bipity, Biogenetic Implementation of Parameters to Perfect Terrestrial Intelligence, considerable autonomy. I did, however, exhort its directors, Obadiah Goody, Homer Gumby, Harry Bosch, Vance Ike, to learn from the mistakes of Mother Nature, who had disfigured all living things, who had herself blocked the most likely routes leading to intelligence, for which, of course, one could not blame her, seeing as how she worked in the dark, so to speak, on a day-to-day -day basis. We, in contrast, should act purposefully, keeping ever before us the grand goal, namely, bippity. They promised me they would follow these guidelines implicitly, and guaranteeing success went into action. Honoring that precious autonomy of theirs, I didn't interfere, didn't monitor them across the one and a half billion years, but the great quantity of anonymous mail that came in finally induced me to do some checking up, what I found was enough to turn one gray. First, they had amused themselves like children for a good four hundred million years, turning out fish with armor and some sort of trilobites or other. Then, seeing how little time remained until the end of the eon, they scrambled. 
They threw together units haphazardly, any which way, one more preposterous than the next, producing now a mountain of flesh on four legs, now a tail without a body, now something like a speck of dust. Some specimens they paved all over with cobblestones of bone. With others, they stuck on horns, tusks, tubes, trunks, tentacles, all indiscriminately. And oh, how ugly it was, how repulsive, senseless, altogether appalling, pure abstractionism, surrealism, a page straight out of modern art. What really infuriated me was their smugness. They said that my buttoned-down conventionality was a thing of the past, that I wasn't with it, that I had no feel for form, etc. I held my peace. If only they had limited themselves to this. But no. In that carefully chosen group, everyone was out to backstab everyone else. It was not of homo sapiens, they thought, but rather how to torpedo the projects of their colleagues. Thus hardly would a new species begin to make its way in nature before some monstrosity was marshaled out, developed for the sole purpose of killing off the rival model, demonstrating thereby its inferiority. What has been called the struggle for existence resulted from professional jealousies and sabotage. The fangs and claws of evolution, then, simply reflect the infighting that went on in the department. Instead of teamwork there, I found widespread boondoggling and constant attempts to trip up the species of one's fellow employee. They got their greatest kick, it seemed, when they were able to scotch all further development on a line under someone else's management. This is the reason we have so many blind alleys in the kingdom of living things. I shouldn't say living. They had turned it into something halfway between a waxworks and a cemetery. Not finishing one job, they hurried off to the next. The lungfish and arthropods, they never gave an even break. They put an end to their chances with the windpipe. And if it hadn't been for me, we wouldn't have even made it to the age of steam and electricity, for they forgot about carbon that is, about planting the trees which were supposed to produce the coal for future steam engines. During the inspection, I wrung my hands in despair. The whole planet was cluttered with corpses and wrecks. Bosch, in particular, had had a field day. When I asked him what earthly purpose was served by that rampharynchus with its tail copied off of some child's kite, and wasn't he ashamed about the proboscidea, and why lizards with spines like fence rails on their back, he replied that I didn't understand the frenzy of creative inspiration. I asked him to show me just where, then, in this state of affairs, intelligence was supposed to take root. The question was purely rhetorical, since between them they had stymied all the promising lines of descent. I hadn't imposed upon them any ready-made solutions, but only reminded them beforehand of the birds, the eagles, and now here was something that flew. They'd micro-miniaturized its head, and here was something that ran like an ostrich, reduced to utter idiocy. Only two possibilities were left— either make intelligent man from the marginal remains, or, on the other hand, have a battering ram sort of evolution, that is, forcing open all the blocked-up branches of development. But force was out of the question, for such obvious interference would later be recognized by the paleontologists as miraculous, and long ago I had forbidden the use of miracles so as not to mislead the generations to come. All of these unprincipled designers I dismissed from their positions, that is, from their time, and then there were the mass burials of their abortions, for those unfinished died off by the millions. The rumor that I ordered the species killed is just another of the many calumnies that have been liberally disseminated against me. It wasn't I who moved life from one corner of the evolutionary process to the other, like a piece of furniture, who doubled the trunk of the amoebododon, who inflated the dromedary, gigantocamelus, to the size of an elephant, who dabbled at whales. It wasn't I who drove the mammoth to self-annihilation. For throughout, I lived by the project not for the sort of shameless game which Goody's group had made of evolution. Ike and Bosch I banished to the Middle Ages, and Gumby, since he had parodied the whole idea of bippity, among other things he created the man-horse and the woman-fish, which in addition was equipped with a high soprano. Homer Gumby I sent as far back as antiquity, to Thrace. What followed was something I had seen happen before, and would again, more than once. The exiles, now deprived of the opportunity to create real things, gave vent to their frustrations in vicarious, sublimated work, Anyone interested in what else Bosch had up his sleeve can find out by taking a look at his paintings. Clearly, the man had talent. It shows, for one, in the way he was able to fit in with the spirit of the period, hence the ostensible religiousness of his canvases, all those last judgments and scenes from hell. Even so, Bosch couldn't refrain from certain indiscretions. In the Garden of Earthly Delights, in the very center of the musical hell, the right wing of the triptych, stands a twelve-seat chronobus. Not a thing I could do about it. As for Homer, I think I acted wisely, packing him off along with his creatures, to ancient Greece. What he painted has been lost, but his writings were preserved. Strange that no one has noticed the anachronisms in them. Surely it's obvious he didn't take seriously the occupants of Olympus, who are constantly out to foil one another's plans, in a word, behaving exactly like his colleagues at the Institute. The Iliad and Odyssey are Romains à clay. The irascible Zeus, for instance, that's a satire on me. Goody, however, I didn't dismiss right away, since Rosenbeiser spoke up for him. 
If this man let me down, he said, then I could send him, the research director of the project, into the Archaeozoic, if I liked. Goody supposedly had hidden resources, contributions to make. When I opposed the idea of utilizing the monkey leftovers, he started in on BARF, binary anthropogenesis for reciprocal feedback. I didn't put much stock in his BARF, but raised no objections, for by now the word was that I'd turned down any and all proposals. The next reconnaissance flight showed that he had forced a couple of small mammals into the ocean, made them similar to fish, threw in some frontal radar, and was just then at the dolphin stage. Somehow he had gotten it into his head that to achieve harmony, two intelligent species were needed, land and sea. How asinine. It would lead to conflicts, of course. I told him, intelligent beings in the water are out. So the dolphin remained the way it was, with a brain several sizes too big, and we had a crisis on our hands. What now? Start evolution all over again, from the beginning? I couldn't. My nerves were shot. I told Goody to do as he saw fit. In other words, I accepted the monkey as a working model, but made him promise to pretty it up a bit. And so he couldn't plead ignorance later on, I supplied him with guidelines. In writing, through official channels, though without its true, going into all the details. I did, however, point out in what poor taste those naked anal areas were, and advised a sensitive, dignified approach to the matter of sex, suggesting something in the spirit of the flowers, lilies of the valley, buds. Then on my way out... I had to attend a session of the committee. I asked him personally not to muff it in his usual fashion, but find instead some nice motifs. His studio was a shambles. Here and there, beams of some sort jutting out, planks, saws. What did they have to do with love? Have you gone mad, I said. Love on the principle of the buzz saw. I made him give me his solemn word he'd throw away the saw. He nodded zealously, laughing to himself all the while, for he'd already learned that his walking papers lay waiting in my desk, therefore knew he had nothing to lose. He decided to get even with me. He blustered, telling everyone that the old boy, namely me, would crap in his pants when he returned, and I certainly did. Good Lord! I summoned him at once. He played the conscientious employee, insisting he'd adhere to the guidelines. Yet instead of getting rid of that bald spot in the back, he had shaved the entire monkey. I rather did it all in reverse. And as far as love and sex went, well, that was clear sabotage on his part. I mean, the very choice of the place. But I need hardly dwell on that piece of treachery. What its effect was, you can all see for yourselves. Yes, Monsieur the Engineer really went out of his way. The monkeys were what they were, but at least vegetarian. He made them carnivorous, too. I called an emergency meeting of the committee to consider the matter of the rehumanization of Homo sapiens, and there was told that this could no longer be accomplished in a single blow. One would have to backtrack twenty-five, possibly even thirty million years. I was outvoted, but didn't make use of my veto power. Perhaps I should have, but I was on my last legs now. Anyway, signals were coming in from the 18th and 19th centuries. To make things easier for themselves, the officials of Moira, tired of constantly having to drive back and forth in time, set up residence in various old castles, palaces, and basements, and taking absolutely no precautions until there began to be rumors of damned souls, chains rattling, the sound of the chronocycle starting up, and ghosts, for they wore white, as if they couldn't have picked a better color for their uniform. They made people's heads spin, frightened them by passing through walls and doors, Taking off in time always looks like that, for the chronocycle stays put while the earth continues turning. And all in all, they created such a disturbance that finally it brought on the birth of romanticism. After punishing the culprits, I tended to Goody and Rosenweiser. I deported the both of them, fully aware that the research committee would never forgive me for it. In any event, I'm not vindictive. Rosenweiser, who behaved towards me afterwards in a positively scandalous manner, in exile conducted himself quite decently, as Julian the Apostate. He did not a little to improve in Byzantium the lot of the poor, which only shows that the reason he failed at his job was that he just didn't measure up. Being an emperor is peanuts compared to overseeing the renovation of all history. Thus concluded the second phase of the project. I then gave the Department of Social Affairs permission to begin, since all we could perfect now was the history of civilization. Getting down to work, Doddle and Leto were clearly delighted that their predecessors had blundered so completely, yet at the same time they warned me in advance playing it safe, the dogs, that one could not expect too much of Theo Hip Hip now, not with that kind of homo sapiens. Doddle entrusted the carrying out of his first experimental corrective program to the chronologians. These were Candel Aber, Can de la Breu, Gir Andol, and G.I.R. Andol. The team was to work under the direct leadership of engineer historiologist Hemdreiser. He and his colleagues planned to expedite the cultural process through urbanizational acceleration, it was in Lower Egypt of the 12th, or maybe the 13th, dynasty, I no longer remember which, that they amassed great piles of building material with the aid of temporal agents, whom we commonly called time plants, and raised the general level of architectural know-how. But owing to a lack of adequate supervision, the plan miscarried. 
Briefly, instead of mass housing construction, what we ended up with, in the framework of a cult of personality, was of no earthly use to anyone. That is, tombs for various and sundry pharaohs. I transported the entire team to Crete. That was how the Palace of Minos came about. I don't know if it's true, but better part told me that the exiles then quarreled, rose up against their former chief, and put him in the labyrinth. Not having checked the records, I can't say for sure, but to me, Hemdreiser doesn't look like any minotaur. I decided to put a stop to this hit-and-run approach and requested the submission of proposals of a more long-range nature. We had to make up our minds whether to act openly or in secret, that is, whether the people of various periods should be at all allowed to discover that someone was helping them from outside history. Doddle, something of a liberal, was in favor of cryptochronism, which I too advocated. The alternative strategy would make it necessary to place all the nations of the past under an open protectorate, which couldn't help but give them the feeling of being disenfranchised. Therefore, we ought to offer assistance, but anonymously. Lado objected. He had in mind a plan for an ideal government, into which he wanted to pull and consolidate all societies. I backed Doddle, who introduced me to one of the youngest and presumably best of his assistants. This graduate student, Otto Noy, was the inventor of monotheism. God, as he explained to me, was an idea which in itself could harm no one, yet would give us, the optimizers, a free hand, since according to the plan, his decisions were to be ipso facto mysterious. The people wouldn't be able to understand them, therefore they wouldn't criticize, and neither would they suspect that anyone was tampering with their history, telechronically. Not a bad idea on the face of it, but just to be safe, I gave the young M.A. a small area only to test his theory, and in a remote corner of the world at that, in Asia Minor. He could have at his disposal the tribe of Judah, his helper was one engineer historiologician, Joseph Hobbes. A routine check revealed that they had committed a number of serious breaches. It was bad enough that Noy ordered 60,000 tons of pearl barley to be dropped during a desert outing of some Jews. The discreet assistance he was supposed to render them led to so much intervention, he opened and closed the Red Sea, sent remote control locusts against the enemies of Judah, that the recipients of this patronage finally had their heads turned. They declared themselves a chosen people. Invariably, whenever a plan went wrong in its realization, the planner, instead of changing tactics, would resort to more and more powerful stimuli. But Otto Noy outdid everyone when he used napalm. Why did I permit it, you ask? Permit it? I knew nothing about it. At the Institute's proving ground, he had demonstrated only the remote control igniting of a bush, assuring us that that was the sort of thing he'd be doing in the past. You know, a few dried-up cactuses in the desert might burn, nothing more. This display, I suppose, was an attempt on his part to comply with moral norms, after banishing him to the Sinai Peninsula, I strictly forbade all the group directors to license any acts of a supernatural appearance. And, of course, what Noy and Hobbes did had historical repercussions. But that was typical. Every telechronic intervention set off an avalanche of events, which couldn't be held in check without appropriate measures, and those in turn produced new perturbations, and so on and so on. Otto Noy's conduct in exile was highly improper. He capitalized on the fame he created for himself earlier in the position of historiometrist. It's true he was now no longer able to work his miracles. However, the memory of them endured. As for Joe Hobbs, I know it's been said that I had my time troopers lean on him, but that's a lie. I'm not familiar with the facts of the case. There wasn't time to bother about such details. But apparently he had fallen out with Otto Noy, and the latter made things so hot for him that eventually it started the legend of Job. The Jews came out the worst in this experiment, for by this time they firmly believed in their favored status, and consequently, after the project withdrew, there was more than one bitter pill for them to swallow both in their homeland and during the diaspora. I won't tell you what my enemies at the project had to say about me on that particular subject. At any rate, the project now entered the stage of its most difficult crises. I bear some of the blame for this, inasmuch as, giving in to Doddle and Leto, I permitted the betterment of history on a broad front, that is, not in isolated moments and locations, but over the whole length of the historical timeline. That strategy of amelioration, called integrated, made a tangle of our scene of operations, in order to head off which, I placed groups of observers in each century, and also gave Lado the authority to organize a secret Tim police force, which would combat delinquency in time. This delinquency, something that never would have entered my head even in a nightmare, had to do with the so-called business of the brooms. It was the work of groups of wild youths, mostly recruited from our staff personnel, lab technicians, secretaries, etc. Those endless medieval tales of pacts with the devil, incubi and succubi, sabbats, witch trials, temptations of saints, etc., all of that derived from bootleg chronomotion, practiced by adolescents bereft of any moral ballast. An individual chronocycle consists of a pipe, a saddle, and an exhaust funnel. Therefore, one could easily mistake it, particularly in bad lighting, for a broom. A number of shameless hussies went off on joy rides, usually at night, terrorizing villages in the early Middle Ages. 
Not only did they go swooping over people's heads, but actually set out, for the 13th, say, or 12th century, in shocking dishabille, topless even. It's not surprising, then, that they were thought to be, for the lack of any better description, naked witches astraddle flying brooms. By an odd coincidence, I was aided in the tracking down and capture of the guilty parties by none other than H. Bosch, at that time already in exile. He certainly wasn't about to faint at the sight of an ordinary temperition, and in his hell cycle painted true-to-life portraits, not of devils, but of dozens of illegal chronocyclists and their cohorts, which was all the easier for him and that many he knew personally. Considering the number of people victimized by these chronooligan escapades, I sent the offenders back 700 years, the 20th century student radicals. Meanwhile, since the field of our activities had now spread over more than 40 centuries, Anne Betterpart, commander-in-chief of Moira, informed me that the situation was getting out of hand and asked for special reinforcements in the form of emergency crews of chronoshootists. They began to take on hundreds of new workers, sending them off immediately to where the distress signals were coming from, though often these were people with little or no training. Their being concentrated in certain centuries led to serious incidents, things like migrations of whole nations. We did our best to conceal the arrival of each such landing party, but in the twentieth century, about halfway through, there was common talk of flying saucers, for the circulation of the news was made possible by a then rapidly developing mass media technology. Yet this was nothing compared to the next scandal, whose author and leader principal character turned out to be the chief of Moira himself. I began to receive reports from time to the effect that his people were not so much observing the process of meliorization as they were actively participating in the historical process, and this not in the spirit of Lado and Doddle's instructions, but rather according to their own temporal politics, which was being merrily pursued by better part. Before I was able to remove him from his post, he absconded, that is, fled to the eighteenth century, for there he could count on his old cronies. The next thing I knew, he was emperor of France. This foul deed called for severe punishment. Lado suggested I dispatch a reserve brigade against Versailles of 187, but that was quite out of the question. Such a raid would undoubtedly produce an unparalleled perturbation in all subsequent history. Mankind would realize from there on out that it was in protective custody. The more circumspect Doddle came up with a plan for the natural, that is, cryptochronist castigation of Napoleon. The mounting of an anti-Bonapartist coalition was begun, military marching drills, but wouldn't you know, the chief of Moira got wind of it immediately and lost no time in assuming the offensive himself. Not for nothing was he a professional strategist. He had strategy in his little finger, and one by one defeated all the enemies Doddle sent up against him. For a while it looked like we had him cornered in Russia, but in that campaign, too, he gave us the slip somehow. Meanwhile, half of Europe lay in smoldering ruins. Finally, I made my well-meaning shapers of history step aside and dealt with Napoleon myself near Waterloo, as if that were anything to boast about. Napoleon escaped from Elba. There hadn't been time to arrange a better exile. So many other matters demanded my immediate attention. Those guilty of infractions were now no longer quietly waiting to receive their just deserts, but taking off post-haste for the distant past, smuggling out things to help them acquire fame or an aura of extraordinary powers. These were the alchemists, Cagliostro, Simon Magus, and scores of others. And reports came in, reports I had no way of verifying. For example that Atlantis was sunk not by any ricochet from Operation Genesis, but by one Dr. Huey Hokum, with premeditation to keep me from finding out what mischief he had perpetrated there. In a word, everything was falling apart on me. I lost my faith in a successful outcome, and, what was worse, had grown suspicious. I no longer knew what was the result of optimization, and what the effect of its abandonment, and what, for that matter, was due to the insubordination and corruption among my centurial police patrols. I decided to attack the problem from the other end. I picked up a copy of the Great Encyclopedia of World History in twelve volumes and started studying it, and whenever anything seemed the least bit suspicious to me, I sent out a reconnaissance flight. Such was the case, for example, with Cardinal Richelieu. Having checked with Moira and made sure that this was not one of our agents, I asked Lado to place a controller of some intelligence there. He entrusted the mission to a certain Reichplatz. Then something told me to consult a dictionary. I turned numb, for sure enough, Richelieu and Reichplatz meant the same thing, rich place, but by then it was too late, since he had already worked his way up into the higher circles of the court and was now the great eminence of Louis XIII. I left him alone, for after the Napoleonic Wars I knew what such attempts could lead to. In the meantime, another problem was developing. Certain centuries were literally crawling with exiles. The Tim police couldn't keep tabs on them. They were spreading rumors, superstitions, purely to spite me, or actually tried bribing the controllers— so I started herding all those who were up to no good into a single place in single time, namely ancient Greece, as a result of which that turned out to be the spot where civilization made its greatest strides. Why, there were more philosophers in the town of Athens than in all the rest of Europe. By then, Lado and Doddle had already been banished. Both of them abused my trust. 
Lado, one of the most hard-headed fanatics that ever was, sabotaged my orders by pursuing his own policy. Its full exposition you can find in his Republic, which was undemocratic in the extreme, based on oppression, in fact. Take the Middle Kingdom, for instance, the caste system in India, the Holy Roman Empire, and even the Japanese belief in the divinity of the Mikado from 1868 on. Yes, that too was his doing. As to whether or not he married off some Miss Schicklgruber or other, so that that famous child could be born, who later trampled half of Europe underfoot, I can't say for sure, as it was Doddle who told me this, and he and Lado had always been at one another's throats. Lado designed the Aztec kingdom. Doddle sent the Spaniards there. At the last minute, receiving a report from Moira, I ordered Columbus's trip postponed, and horses to be bred in South America, for Cortez's men would never hold up against a cavalry of Indians. However, the coordinators bungled, and the horses all died out as far back as the quaternary, when there weren't any Indians around, so we had no one to pull the war wagons, though the wheel was available in plenty of time. As for Columbus, he made it in 1492, having greased the right palms. That's how this optimization of ours worked. I was even accused, as if there weren't more than enough philosophers in Greece already, of having Harris Doddle and Pat Lado transported there. Not true. It was precisely to show a little humanity that I let them choose the time and place of exile. I did, I'll admit, deposit Plato, not exactly where he wanted, but in Syracuse, for I knew that, what with the wars going on in that city, he wouldn't be able to put into practice that pet idea of his, the kingdom of philosophers. Harris Doddle became, as everyone knows, tutor to young Alexander the Macedonian. He had been guilty of oversights and with ghastly consequences, giving in, as he invariably did, to that weakness he had for composing enormous encyclopedias. Doddle would dabble at classification, as well as a general methodology for his theory of the perfect project, while behind his back all sorts of things were going on. The head accountant, unsupervised, threw in with a frogman friend of his. Together they fished out the gold of Montezuma from the same canal in which Cortez's men had foundered during their retreat, and with that played the stock market starting in 1922. But crime doesn't pay, and they brought on the well-known crash of 1929. I don't believe I dealt unfairly with Aristotle. It was to me, after all, that he owed his fame, which he certainly didn't merit as far as his work on the project went. But then it was said that under the pretext of dismissals, replacements, and exiles, I was running a kind of nepotistic merry-go-round, setting my old pals up in plush sinecures throughout the ages. Well, with such critics, I was damned if I did, damned if I didn't. There isn't time to go into details, so I won't dwell on the allusions to myself contained in the works of Plato and Aristotle. Naturally, they weren't exactly thrilled about their exile, but I couldn't concern myself with personal resentments, not with the fate of mankind hanging in the balance. Greece was another matter entirely, and I took her downfall very much to heart. It isn't true I brought it about by putting all those philosophers together. Leto kept an eye on things there. He did it for the sake of Sparta, which he hoped to mold into the image of his beloved Utopia. But after his removal, there was no one to sustain the Spartans, and they folded up before the Persian army. And what could I do about it? Local favoritism was unthinkable. No, we had to extend our protection to all humanity, and yet here was this problem of the exiles undermining our most vital plans. I couldn't send anyone into the future. They were on the lookout up there. And since every blessed one of the condemned requested the Azure Coast, and I couldn't refuse, great numbers of people possessing a higher education became concentrated around the Mediterranean, and, well, that's precisely where you have your cradle of civilization, and later, the culture of the West. As for Spinoza, a very good man, I grant you, but he allowed the Crusades, though he didn't actually start them himself. I put him in Lado's place. Oh, he had a sterling character, but what a wool-gatherer, signing whatever they stuck in front of him without even looking. He gave unlimited powers to live in Hertz. Yes, the lion-hearted. Then someone back in the 13th century was hatching something, and when they began looking for the guilty party, live in Hertz threw in Cronobus after Cronobus of secret agents. So the suspect, I forget who it was, caused the Crusades in order to hide in the resulting confusion. I didn't know what to do with Spinoza. Greece was already overflowing with thinkers like himself. First I had him travel back and forth across the ages, letting him seesaw with a 40-century amplitude, which gave rise to the legend of the wandering Jew. However, each time he swung through our here and now, he complained of fatigue, so I finally sent him off to Amsterdam, for he liked to tinker with things, and there could cut diamonds to his heart's content. More than once I've been asked why none of the exiles chose to reveal from where they came. A lot of good it would have done them. Anyone who told the truth would have found himself quickly headed for the loony bin. Wouldn't a man have been thought crazy before the twentieth century who claimed that out of ordinary water you could make a bomb capable of blowing the entire globe to bits? And before the twenty-third century, certainly, there was no knowledge of chronomotion. Besides which, such admissions would have laid bare the derivative nature of the work of many of the exiles. We forbade them to prophesy the future, but even so they let more than one cat out of the bag. In the Middle Ages, happily, no one paid much attention to those references to jets and bathyspheres and bacon, 
or the computers in Lull's Ars Magna. It was worse with the exiles sent in providently to the 20th century. Calling themselves futurologists, they began to give out top-secret information. Fortunately, General Angus Khan, the new chief of Moira after Napoleon, employed the so-called Babel tactic. This was how it worked. Once, sixteen tempo engineers, summarily banished to Asia Minor, decided to build a time main to escape under the guise of constructing some sort of tower or dome. The name given to it was the cryptonym password of their plot, Banished Asian Builders Escape League. Moira, having detected their operation in a fairly advanced stage, dispatched its own specialists to the spot as new exiles, and these intentionally introduced such errors into the blueprint that the mechanism flew apart at the very first trial run. Khan repeated this maneuver of communication confusion, sending diversionary units into the 20th century. They completely discredited those who were trying to set themselves up as prophets by turning out all sorts of rubbish, called science fiction, and placing in the ranks of the futurologists our secret agent, one McLuhan. I must confess that when I read through the malarkey that Moira had prepared, and which McLuhan was to disseminate as his prognoses, I threw up my hands in despair, for it didn't seem possible to me that anyone with half a brain could take seriously, even for a minute, all that crap about the global village towards which the world was supposed to be heading, not to mention the other inanities contained in that hash. And yet, as it turned out, McLuhan was a much greater success than all the people who were betraying the simple truth. He acquired such fame that he ended up actually believing, so it seems, the drivel we had ordered him to advocate. We didn't remove him, though, since this didn't hurt us in the least. As for Swift and his Gulliver's Travels, in which there is a reference plain as day to the two small satellites of Mars, including all the elements of their motion, which no one could have known at the time, that was the result of an idiotic mistake. The orbital data for the moons of Mars served then as a secret password among a group of our controllers in southern England, and one of them, nearsighted, took Swift at a tavern for the new agent he was scheduled to meet with there. He didn't report his blunder, thinking that Swift had understood nothing of his words. However, two years later, 1726, in the first edition of Gulliver's Travels, we found an accurate description of both Martian moons. The password was immediately changed, but that passage had to stay the way it was in print. Nevertheless, these ultimately were trifling matters, of no great consequence. With Plato, it was different. I am always overcome with pity when I read his story of the cave, in which one sits with one's back to the world, seeing just its shadow on the wall. Is it so surprising that he should have felt the twenty-seventh century to be the only true reality, and the primitive age in which I had imprisoned him a gloomy cave, and his doctrine of knowledge as naught but the self-recollection of that which once before life was known far better, is an illusion even more obvious. Meanwhile, things were going from bad to worse. I had to drop Khan because he helped Napoleon escape from Elba. This time I took Mongolia as the place of exile, for he was hopping mad and swore that I'd remember him. What trouble the man could cause me out in that wilderness I couldn't imagine, and yet he kept his word. Seeing what the situation was, our designers tried to outdo each other in coming up with harebrained schemes. For example, to supply impoverished nations with masses of goods via giant time mains, but that would have stopped all progress. Or again, to take a million or so enlightened citizens from our modern day and deposit them like an army in the Paleolithic. Fine, only what was I supposed to do with the people already sitting there in their caves? Reading these plans aroused my suspicions when I looked more closely at the twentieth century. The means for mass annihilation, could they have been planted there? There were, I had heard, a couple of radicals at the Institute who wanted to twist time around in a circle, so that somewhere after the twenty-first century contemporaneity would merge with prehistory. In this way, everything was to start out once more from the beginning, only better. A sick idea, bizarre, ridiculous, yet I saw what appeared to be the signs of preparations— Overgrowth demanded first the destruction of the existing civilization, a return to nature, and indeed from the middle of the twentieth century on you had a marked increase in antisocial behavior, kidnappings, bombings, young people growing shaggier by the year, and all the erotica coarsened, become bestial. Hordes of hairy rag wearers rendered ear-splitting homage not to the sun, perhaps, but to certain stars and superstars. There were clamorous calls for the abolition of technology, of science. Even those futurologists considered to be scientists proclaimed, but who put them up to it? Impending doom, decline, the end. Here and there you even had already caves being built, though they were called, possibly to avoid recognition, shelters. I decided to concentrate on the centuries that followed, for this whole business smacked of revolution, that is, revolving time around in the opposite direction, precisely on the principle of the circle. But just then I was invited to attend a special session of the research committee. My friends told me privately that I would be tried there. This, however, didn't keep me from the performance of my duties. My final action was to settle the matter of a certain Adler, who, while working as an inspection officer, brought back with him from the twelfth century a young girl he had carried off in broad daylight. Overtaken in an open field before the gaping multitude, she was lifted up onto his chronocycle. 
They considered her a saint, and her abduction in time as her assumption. I should have gotten rid of Adler long before. He was a thorough brute, of an appearance unusually repulsive, looking like a gorilla with those deep-set eyes of his and the heavy jaw, but I didn't want people to think me prejudiced. Now, however, I sent him packing, and quite a distance, too, to be safe, about sixty-five thousand years back. He became a prehistoric Casanova and begat the Neanderthals. I showed up at the meeting with my head held high, for my conscience was clear. It went on for more than ten hours. I sat and listened to accusation after accusation. They charged me with acting arbitrarily, with riding roughshod over the scholars, with disregarding the opinion of the experts, with favoritism towards Greece, with the fall of Rome, with the Julius Caesar incident. That, too, was a lie. I hadn't sent out any Brutus anywhere. With the Reichsplatz affair, that is, Cardinal Richelieu, with abuses in the Moira section and Tempolis, with the popes and antipopes, actually the Dark Ages were caused by better part, who, with his predilection for the Iron Hand approach, had stuck so many informers in between the 8th and ninth centuries that the result was mums the word and cultural stagnation. The recital of the Bill of Indictment, drawn up in 7,000 separate clauses, amounted to a public reading of a textbook on world history. I was taken to task for Otto Noy, for the Burning Bush, Sodom and Gomorrah, for the Vikings, for the wheels on the war wagons in Asia Minor, for no wheels on the war wagons in South America, for the Crusades, for the slaughter of the Albigenses, Berthold Schwarz and his powder, and where was I supposed to put him, in antiquity, so they could get the grape shot all the sooner? And so forth, on and on. Nothing suited the Honorable Committee now, neither the Reformation nor the Counter-Reformation, and the very same people who once had come running to me with exactly those proposals, swearing to their salutary nature, Rosenweiser practically got down on his knees for permission to start the Reformation, now sat there, the very picture of innocence. When asked at the end if I had anything to say in my defense, I replied that I had no intention of defending myself. History would judge us. Still, I couldn't resist one parting shot before relinquishing the floor. I observed, to wit, that whatever progress, whatever good the past could show after the project's efforts, was entirely owing to me. I was referring here to the positive results of the mass banishment policy I had initiated. It was I whom mankind had to thank for Homer, Plato, Aristotle, Boscovich, Leonardo da Vinci, Bosch, Spinoza, and those nameless thousands who sustained human creativity throughout the centuries. However bitter was the fate of the exiles, they had had it coming to them, and yet at the same time they were able, thanks to me, to pay off their debt to history, for they furthered history the best they could, but only after their removal from high positions in the project. On the other hand, if anyone wished to know what the experts of the project had been up to, meanwhile, he could take a look at Mars, Jupiter, Venus, at the butchered moon. He could go and see Atlantis, buried at the bottom of the Atlantic. He could count the victims of two great glacial epochs, of plagues, epidemics, pestilences, wars, religious fanaticisms. In short, he could examine general history, which after improvement had become nothing but a battleground of melioristic schemes, a chaos, an unholy mess. History was the victim of the Institute, of its constant intrigues, connivings, confusion, short-sightedness, improvisation, incompetence. And if it had been up to me, I would have sent the whole epoch-making batch of them off to where the brontosaurs roamed free. I hardly need tell you that my words met with a somewhat sour reception. Though this was supposed to have been the final plea, several more worthy temporalists requested to be heard. Men like I.G. Noramus, Stu Pitt, M. Tegule, and Rosenbeiser, too, was there. Yes, his worthy colleagues had managed to fetch him all the way from Byzantium. Knowing ahead of time the outcome of the voting to relieve me of my directorship, they had staged a death on the field of battle for Julian the Apostate, 363, so eager was he to be present at this spectacle. But before he could speak, I raised a point of order to ask since when did Byzantine emperors have the right to participate in the Institute's proceedings. My question was ignored. Rosenweiser had come prepared. He must have received materials while still in Constantinople. The machination was as subtle as a ton of bricks, but they weren't even trying to conceal it. He accused me of amateurism, of pretending to know music, and this, with my atrocious ear, had resulted in seriously perverting the development of theoretical physics. Here was how, according to the Herr Professor, it had happened. Upon conducting a remote control survey of the intelligence of all the children at the turn of the 19th century, our hyperputer had come up with a list of young boys who in early manhood would be capable of deriving the equivalence of matter and energy, vital for releasing the power of the atom. These were, among others, Pierre Solitaire, Trofim Obnakamenyak, John Singlestone, Masanare Kotsumuto Biushuyoto, Aristides Monolapides, and Giovanni Unopetra, besides little Albi Einstein. I had been so bold as to show favoritism to the latter, for I liked the way he played the violin. Years later, because of that, the bombs were dropped on Japan. 
Rosenbeiser was twisting the facts so shamelessly it took my breath away. Violin playing had nothing to do with the case. No, the bastard was simply trying to shift his own blame under me. The hyperputer, running prognostic simulations of sequels to various events, had foreseen the atom bomb in Mussolini's Italy for a theory of relativity from Uno Pitra, and a series of even worse catastrophes for the other lads. I selected Einstein because he was a good child. For that which developed afterwards with those atoms, neither he nor I should have to answer. Indeed, I had acted against the advice of Rosenweiser, who recommended the prophylactic denuding of the earth of children of preschool age in order that atomic energy be released in the safe 21st century, and even introduced me to a chronolician who was ready to take on the job. Naturally, I banished that dangerous man at once, Herod, or Herod was his name, to Asia Minor, where he in fact committed a number of heinous acts. They figured in one of the articles of indictment. Yet what else could I have done with him? I had to send him to some time, didn't I? But there's no point in my trying to refute that mountain of trumped-up charges. After the vote on my dismissal from the project, Rosenbeiser ordered me to present myself forthwith at the office. I found him already sitting at my desk as acting director. And whom do you think I saw there at his side? Why, Goody, Gestirner, Astroyani, Starbuck, and the other Deadwood, too. Rosenbeiser had already managed to spring them from their respective centuries. As for himself, the stay in Byzantium had done him a world of good. Lean and tan after his campaign against the Persians, he had brought back coins with his own profile stamped on them, gold brooches, signet rings, and a heap of finery, which he was in the process of showing to his cronies, but quickly stuck them in the drawer when I walked in, and puffed himself up, and sat back and spoke with a drawl through his teeth, without looking at me, like some sort of emperor. Barely able to keep from gloating in triumph, he told me haughtily that I was free to go home, provided I agreed to carry out a certain errand. Namely, I was, when I got back, to persuade Ian Tihi, the Ian Tihi who all this time had been staying at my house, to assume the directorship of Theo Hip Hip. A sudden flash of understanding pierced my brain. It was only now that I realized why I, of all people, had been chosen to act as envoy to my self-same self. The hyperputer's prognosis, after all, remained in force. Therefore, no one was better suited for the job of directing the correction of the past than I. So they weren't doing this to be generous, as if they cared, but purely in their own self-interest. Yes, of course, I, Tiki, who had originally talked me into this whole business, remained in the past and was living in my house. I understood further that the time loop would be closed only at the precise moment when I, I this time, reached the library and, breaking the chronocycle, knocked all the volumes off the shelf. The other eon would be in the kitchen, a skillet in his hand, caught off guard by my unexpected appearance, for I would now be playing the part of the messenger from the future, while he, the occupant of the house, would be the recipient of the message. The seeming paradox of the situation was a product of the inevitable relativity of time entailed by the mastering of chronomotive technology. The real perfidiousness of the plan devised by the hyperputer lay in the fact that it had created a double loop in time, a little loop within a large. In the little loop, starting out, my duplicate and I went round and round until I finally agreed to leave for the future. But afterwards, the large loop continued to remain open. This was the reason I hadn't understood at the time just how he had landed up in that future he claimed to come from. In the little loop, I had been constantly the earlier, and he the later, Ian Tiki. But now the roles would be reversed, seeing that the times were switched around. This time I was coming to him from the future, as an emissary. He, presently the previous me, would in turn have to take command of the project. In the final analysis, then, we were going to change places in time. The only thing I still couldn't figure out was why he hadn't let me in on this back then in the kitchen. But suddenly that, too, was clear, for wasn't Rosenbeiser making me promise on my sacred word of honor not to reveal a thing of what had happened in the project? And if I refused to give him my word, instead of a chronocycle, I'd be handed a pension and couldn't go anywhere. What was I to do? They knew, the devils, that I wouldn't refuse. I would have, had the candidate for my position been any other man, but how can one possibly not trust as a successor one's own self? So then, they had thought of even that eventuality in cooking up this clever little scheme of theirs. Without honors, without fanfare, without so much as a simple word of thanks, or any sort of send-off ceremony, accompanied by the death-like silence of my ex-colleagues, who only recently had been paying me nothing but compliments from morning till night, competing among themselves to regale my mental horizons with some new surprise, and who now all turned their backs as I walked past, I headed for the embarkation hall. Petty maliciousness had prompted my former subordinates to give me the most dilapidated chronocycle they could find. Now I knew why I would be unable to break in time and unfailingly knock over all those bookshelves. But I was unruffled by this last of many indignities. And though the chronocycle shook 